Wireless continues to transform how we consume video. Few know this rapidly changing landscape more than our next two guests. Peter Chernin is the founder of the Chernin Group, a media, technology, and entertainment company. He's also the former president and COO of News Corp. From producing hit shows like Fox's New Girl, or investing in some of the best technology companies around, Peter has a deep understanding of both the creative and the technical. Peter will share the stage with AT&T Entertainment Group CEO John Stanky. John is driving innovation at the largest video provider across the country, mobile, DirecTV, and Uverse. I'm so glad that they've joined us today. So please help me welcome Peter and John. Oh, I'm supposed to stand here. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, you sure. get it? Absolutely. Thanks very much. Well, hello everyone. Peter, welcome. Thank you, John. Appreciate you agreeing to spend a little time with everybody today. Happy to be here. This could be a lot of fun. I've known Peter for a number of years, and he's a great individual. He's a great business mind. Um, I think you'll find him to be candid and direct as we go through this, as he always is, which will be good for all of you. And the best part <laughs> is we're not going to talk about any Gs, are we? I don't know what the Gs are. <laughs> <laughs> What we are going to talk about, though, today is what people are doing with their devices and how mobile plays into that. As, as we know, about 70% of an individual's time is spent on a mobile device entertaining themselves. And certainly from a traffic perspective, entertainment-oriented content, in particular video, drives a huge portion of the network. And so that's why it's relevant that we talk about this today, and I'm really looking forward to some of the discussion. So before I jump into some of the deeper questions, why don't you spend just a couple minutes telling everybody what are you spending your personal cycles on right now, and how are you spending your thought time? Well, I think as it relates to, to this area, you know, it, it doesn't take, to be honest, it doesn't take overwhelming sophistication on my part. I think we are in the first inning of one of the great transitions in the history of the media business, which is, you know, if you look at the media business over the last hundred years, the great fortunes, the great sort of innovation cycles have been built around uh, new platforms, whether that was the move from stage to radio, from radio to television. Um, you know, the biggest one certainly we've seen in our lifetimes was the move to the cable television platform, which is a uh, probably a quarter of a trillion dollar industry. I think we are in the first inning of seeing that next big transition of seeing content migrate to a point where by far the largest distribution of content will be on mobile platforms. And so that's what consumes me more than anything. I think it's one of the great opportunities of my lifetime. I think it's intellectually incredibly stimulating because it's complicated, it's difficult, it's hard. Um, but there's a better opportunity than anything I can think of, and frankly, more fun than anything I can think of. So as you started to get into this, you've been investing in this space for a period of time, looking to build businesses in this space, and you've had a couple of years of cycles on it. Have there been any things on the mobile side that have surprised you as you've kind of gone through this cycle, different assumptions going in that you've kind of learned over the course of the last two, three years that you walk away and say, wow, that's different than where I thought it'd come out? Sure, I would say, look, on some level, almost everything surprises me because it's uncharted territory. So a couple of things. Speed surprises me. You know, I think if you look at, you know, you can pick a couple of examples. Look at Netflix, which is on its way to probably being the most valuable media company in a five-year period. Uh, look at the growth of YouTube, which is I think by far the single largest consumption platform on earth over a very short period of time, over 10 years total, but really most of it in the last five years. Um, so just the size of scale on these things, you know, Facebook, which is now a, a billion seven users, somewhere in that neighborhood, um, almost all of it mobile driven. So scale surprises me and the rapidity to which scale is achieved surprises me. Um, the level of content innovation is hugely surprising. So, you know, just a couple of weird examples. Certainly, YouTube, if somebody had said to you 10 years ago that the single biggest uh, video destination on Earth would be largely self-made videos, you'd say, that's crazy. Um, it clearly isn't crazy. Things like Twitch. 
Twitch, you know, the fact that, you know, Twitch sold, what, about a year and a half ago for over a billion dollars, and that one of the dominant sources of viewing is people watching other people play video games, which certainly to someone of my generation, and maybe even yours, John, <laughs> um, seems a little foreign, but millions and millions of people are watching other people just play video games. Um, Periscope. You know, the growth of live video, Periscope, Facebook Live, hugely interesting. And so um, musically, you know, if any of you have particularly teenage girls under the age of 15, they're consumed with watching essentially homemade lip-synced music videos. So the, the speed of innovation of some new content platforms also fascinates me. I guess the third thing that's really fascinating to me are the levels of community that are growing up in this space. You know, you sort of see... You know, easy examples are some of the services we have together, things like Crunchyroll, which, you know, if somebody had showed me a list of 20 content areas 10 years ago and, and Japanese anime was on them, I'd say... I had that one picked. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would have said, I don't get it. You know, Crunchyroll, I think, is either the fourth or fifth biggest subscription video service in the country at this point. Um, but it's more than just a video experience. It's a, it's a real community. These people, they, they Skype each other, they blog about stuff, they go to conventions, they wear costumes. There's a genuine community among people. And I think that the, what, what mobile has done to accelerate the growth of communities has also been surprising and interesting. So let me back up for you. You've made two <laughs> comments that are interesting. Your first comment about the platform transition is creating the opportunity, and you cited some examples over time in history where that's occurred. You just made an observation at the speed at which some of these platforms are building an audience. Um, you know, the one thing that has remained constant over all this time is really it's about building an audience. And if you think about, you know, going back days maybe in traditional media and the days in Fox and what it took to build an audience as you started a new broadcast network there and you are confronted with the dynamic of building an audience today. What do you think has changed and what kind of remains the same in that regard? Well, I think, I think that there was a, a, a seminal, seminal change in the content business sort of in the mid 80s, which is really where we went from content being defined by essentially three broadcast networks and some local television stations to the growth of cable. And, you know, there was a very famous network programmer, a guy named Fred Silverman, who I don't know if you heard of, who coined a term called least objectionable programming. And the whole thesis was if you were programming a broadcast network and there were only three of them, you won if you had the programming that annoyed the fewest amount of people. That whole paradigm got completely turned on its head in sort of the mid-80s, and everything that's followed has been really an outgrowth of that, which is that you are no longer in the least objectionable programming business. In fact, you're no longer in the middle programming business. You're in the attention-getting business. And the hardest single thing about creating content right now is you have to, <coughs> excuse me, you've got to demand viewers' attention. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, one of the things I always used to say, which is sort of stupid, but it's true, which is, um, I don't know anything about technology, but I do know two things, which is I know there are two results of technology, which is it gives consumers more control and it gives consumers more choice. And that's largely going, has been true over the last 23 years and will continue to be true. Every single piece of technology, every improvements in the, in the system and the platform gives consumers more choice and more control. And in a world in which consumers have more choice and more control, the middle is dead. Because think about it yourself as a, as a consumer. You basically want to watch one of two things. You either want to watch big events that galvanize the world, the Super Bowl, the Olympics, uh, the Academy Awards, uh, the, the new Marvel movie, or you want to watch something specifically targeted to your passions, country music, hunting, knitting, Japanese anime. Um, but, but the notion of watching something that's in the middle that you go, that's, I'm not that interested in this, but it's okay. Those days are dead. And I think that that paradigm will only continue. I think that <clears throat> people will have more and more choice and more and more control. Does that mean that fragmentation <coughs> becomes the dominant model? Or is there going to be a balance between the fragmented content and the big stuff as you characterize it, maybe the, the blockbuster show, the blockbuster sport content as time marches on here? 
Well, I think, first of all, I would probably quibble with the, the word fragmentation because it suggests somehow that it's, you know, it's, it's got some... Uh, highly, target, high, highly targeted, segment-oriented. I think that it? is the way the world's going. I think the world will completely go towards big events, highly targeted. And in either case, the, the huge winner in all of this is the consumer because the consumer gets to watch something they're passionate about. They either watch something big, they're, you know, you, the 100-meter uh, dash in the Olympics is something a huge number of people are passionate about, clearly the Super Bowl, the NBA Finals, or whatever your specific content, Jones, is that you're really excited about this one thing, you can go watch it. Yes, and I think that uh, by definition, the stuff in the middle is gone and gone forever. And not just gone in the video world, gone in every aspect of our lives. You know, gone in the magazine business, gone in the newspaper business, gone in the music business. All those things, they are either big events or specialized, highly desirable specialized things. So the sometimes debated <laughs> issue around what happens with the millennial behavior as they begin to age and move through life cycles, if I were to listen to what you just said and conclude from that, your point of view on that is their habits are changing inevitably forever. Is that kind of your point of view on that? Yes. Yeah, I think that, you know, I don't, uh, by definition, people's tastes change as they grow older. But just as, you know, most of us here, if, if you put us in front of a, a TV that had three broadcast networks and one or two independent television stations, no remote control, no DVR, and a barrage of commercials around you, you wouldn't watch it. I think the same thing, you put millennials in front of, you put them in, you force them to not have DVR functionality, not have uh, the ability to watch what they want to watch, where they want to watch it on any device. Um, it's a non-start. Same thing with ads. You know, I think what, traditional television ads, those days are not returning for millennials. You know, they're not going to sit there and consume television ads in the same way, which, by the way, I happen to think is a huge, huge opportunity for the mobile business. So uh, well, why don't we talk about that for just a second? Because advertising is certainly a key element of it. And if you think about the shift that's occurring in advertising and what the platforms enable, what do you think needs to occur to make that relevant over time? Well, I think that there are uh, two or three things that need to occur. Clearly, as an industry, we got to get really good at using data while respecting privacy to effectively target people and deliver the appropriate message, the appropriate message demographically, the appropriate message from a time perspective, the appropriate message psychographically, the appropriate message geographically. And I think we still have a long way to go on that front. The second thing is that I think we've got to get better at figuring out how to deliver advertising messages that are acceptable. So, you know, there's some interesting statistics that are Clearly, you know, we own a business called Full Screen uh, together. And, you know, we are inside of that trying to build the next generation advertising platform. But so there's some interesting examples, which is 75, 80% of millennials will tell you they have no tolerance whatsoever for traditional advertising. But 50% of them will tell you that they are happy to watch a message from an influencer they believe in. If there's a personality they believe in, they're happy to watch a message. They are also happy to watch a message from a brand to the degree uh, that brand is integrated into the content. Uh, to use a very self-serving example, and frankly to blow your horn, you know, we just did what's essentially a brand message in that it can wait. Uh, it's basically a, a piece of branded content around don't, don't text and drive at the same time, uh, which is in a show which we produce called Summer Break, which AT&T sponsors. But we delivered a, what, probably about a five, six minute video in there. We've had 150 million views in nine days. 150 million views in nine days. And people viewing that not only don't look at it as advertising, but we're getting messages from them saying, this is the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. This has changed my behavior, this changed my life. So I think that not only do we have some technology and data driven issues, but we also have real challenges and opportunities in the way we deliver advertising messages. So let's, uh, let's play on this for just a second because you have a lot of large entrenched media companies that get a substantial portion of their revenue from the advertising ecosystem today. Depending on the business, it could be as high as 60%, could be as low as 30%. So they have a 
vested interest in this, in this evolution of the advertising space if more viewership goes to mobile. Do you believe that these larger companies can make that transition and still support that part of their business? And what do you think the challenges are for them to ultimately make that transition effectively and keep their businesses <coughs> intact? Well, let me answer the second question first. Sure. Uh, and, you know, the, the challenges are almost entirely psychological, emotional, which is it is extraordinarily difficult if you're running one of those businesses to innovate as rapidly as you need to do to be the significant level of player that you should be. Not impossible, by no means impossible, but it's extraordinarily different, difficult because you have these big entrenched businesses. They are, they're challenged, they're hard to run, they're complicated, and by definition, you're killing your lunch on some level. You know, you're killing your existing baby to build a new one. You know, one of the things I used to say when I was running Fox to the people who worked for me was, you know, your job is not to protect your existing business. Because frankly, you can't protect them. To the degree that forces of technology, forces of, uh, use, you know, consumers are arrayed to disintermediate you, that's gonna happen. You're not gonna be able to protect it. Your job is to maximize your existing business but your job is to both maximize your existing business and build new businesses faster than the old ones decay. Um, and that's a really difficult psychological battle. Look, this is a, a harsh example, but I'll give it anyway. We started, I started Hulu ahead of Netflix. We launched Hulu before Netflix had launched their streaming business. And you wake up, I guess that was almost exactly 10 years ago. You wake up 10 years later and Netflix has seven, eight X the subscribers that Hulu has. And it's not because they had better content, it's not because they had better anything, it's because they had no business that they needed to protect. And they were willing to go all in and bet the farm on a regular basis on a new product. So I think the challenges are entirely challenges of psychology and character. And can you innovate rapidly enough in ways that may end up hurting your existing business? Because the truth is, if it's going to get hurt, somebody else is going to hurt it. So it may as well be you building something off the back of it. Can they make the transition? Yes. It's going to be very, very difficult. But I think you're going to see, you know, what they do have is they have vast, vast content resources. And the question is, can they migrate those content resources into new platforms as rapidly as they need to? Now, part of the problem there is, is that you know, the existing, so first of all, among other things, those existing media companies, Disney, Fox, Time Warner, NBC Universal, essentially are, no matter what you say, they are cable channel companies. They generally are getting 75, 80% of their profits are coming from cable channels. Those cable channels are historically, as you're learning very well, I sir, 40 to 50% margin businesses. These new businesses will not be 40 to 50% margin businesses. It's just not gonna happen there. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, God didn't decree that you're supposed to have a 50% margin in your business. And com in fact, competition and capitalism decrees the opposite, which is, you know, competition is supposed to drive margins down to better serve consumers. And so the, the, the challenge is, are you willing to migrate towards what's a lower margin business? By definition, I believe you have to, but it's a really hard thing to do. So go out five years is the prototypical <laughs> media company five years from now a company that's significant, established today, that transformed and, and changed their approach? Or is it going to come from the bottom and be companies that we're just seeing establish themselves today? Um, first of all, if I knew that answer, I'd be. <laughs> I, my guess is it'll be a combination of both. You know, you will certainly see, uh, you know, Instinctively, my, my bias is to say it'll be companies from the bottom. But you do have to give the traditional media business credit. They have, the big ones have been around for 75 years and have done a pretty good job of, of uh, navigating change. And they've largely navigated change on the basis of controlling high quality content. And so I think the ones who are good and nimble and fast and bold should be able to, to make that transition successfully. The ones who are not will go by the wayside. 
Um, and I do think you will certainly see people coming from the bottom up. So if one of those in, uh, established businesses today were to be successful five years from today, you care to opine on what you think the mobile portion of their strategy needs to be over the next five years to be successful and how they need to be thinking about that? Yeah, I think they need to, uh, sure, I think they need to figure out how to aggressively, I guess I'd say it this way, they need to figure out the, what mobile offers them for the most part is an opportunity that none of them really do right now or do in very limited ways, which is connect directly with consumers. Um, you know, and, and the danger for them, particularly in the cable business, is they are pure middlemen and they have no, no relationship with, I guess, the modest exception of the HBOs and the stars and the showtimes of the world, but they have no direct relationship with their consumers. Now, that has been a huge blessing when somebody's paying them for every home in America, regardless of whether or not people are watching it. But in the long run, it's a dangerous place to be. And I think those that successfully manage the transition will get really, really good at connecting directly with their consumers and figuring out how to monetize those consumers in ways that are much wider and much deeper than what they have. So I'll give you two tiny little examples of some of the things we're working on. We own a little business together called Rooster Teeth, which I'm sure none of you ever heard of, which is in many ways, I think, the paradigm of what a new content business is going to be like. And it's a tiny little business right now. But we produce about 1,500 hours a year of content, most of it going on YouTube. We derive about a quarter of our revenues, maybe a third of our revenues, from advertising, traditional advertising. We derive almost as much revenues from selling licensed apparel, rooster teeth apparel, to our consumers because our consumers are so rabid about that brand. They love the brand. We speak to them directly. Another crazy example of them, they hold an annual convention for their fans in Austin, Texas, just down the road from you guys every year. They just finished that convention. It's called RTX, Rooster Teeth. They had 65,000 fans come to Austin, Texas for the weekend to spend the weekend with them pay them money, buy them goods, just mingle with the creators that they love in that business. Um, third example of that business is we have a subscription video service, Rooster Teeth On Demand, which I think is probably somewhere around number eight or 10 of all SVODs in the country. The consumers who buy that don't consider themselves consumers. They identify themselves as sponsors. They identify themselves as we love this content so much that we'd like to help sponsor it. We'd like to give you 4 or $5 a month to sponsor our favorite content. That's the potential appeal of speaking directly, directly to your consumers and directly to a community of your consumers. And those existing brands that are well-defined, that manage to do that effectively, um, I think can make that transition incredibly effectively. So you've, you've hit on a couple of things there. You said one is the establish the direct relationship with the consumer, knowledge of who's actually engaged in your content. Certainly having device specific knowledge of that individual helps you down that path. You talked earlier about how that data then has to be moved into different advertising models that are less intrusive and less pervasive. There's probably a third area I'm guessing, which is how content ultimately gets created for a mobile environment that's more relevant for that space than just uh, what we've kind of done traditionally over the last couple decades. We're coming off of a period right now where there's been a record amount of content production in the last couple of years. Um, your point of view on, number one, is that sustainable? Or are we going to see more pervasive engagement that will support that record amount of content development? And is there some shift that has to go on in that content development to keep it more relevant for this generation that's now moving into a, a much more dynamic wireless and mobile space? Well, the, <clears throat> the traditional content piece that you're alluding to is, let me just give you a fact, I think 15 years ago, there were about 110 scripted series done in the television ecosystem. Um, in fact, when we put The Shield on FX, I believe there were three, which we put on FX in 2001, there were three scripted series on cable. That number is now, there's about 450 scripted series uh, created for television. I believe that that is sustainable for at least the next five, five to 10 years. I think the question mark is 
if the cable bundle collapses, what happens to that? But I don't think the cable bundle collapses within the next five, probably even 10 years. So I think it is sustainable in that sense. And I think it's, it is probably a misconception to think that people don't watch traditional scripted content on their mobile device. They do. You got anybody in this room who has kids, they're watching. They could care less whether, first of all, the idea that there's a 60 inch screen in the house seems like that's a bad thing to them. They seem like they'd rather be alone in their room watching whatever series they love off traditional television on their tiny little cell phone. So, uh, so I think that stuff is highly relevant for mobile. But I also think there are next generations of content that are highly relevant for mobile that we're just beginning, you know, Rooster Teeth being a really good example. That is all mobile first content. The stuff that we're trying to create on our full screen subscription video product, which we just launched three months ago, is clearly mobile first. Uh, musically, you know, which I mentioned earlier, clearly mobile first content. Uh, all of the live video on Periscope and, and, and Facebook, mobile first. Uh, Esports, you know, the, the stuff on Twitch, which I mentioned, is clearly mobile first. So I think that the interesting dynamic is, you know, and I think we've seen this historically with every new development, it's not as if the existing things go away. You know, people are still watching sitcoms, people are still watching two-hour movies, people are still watching cop dramas, but what happens is things get added to it on top of it, and we saw a whole generation of content added by the cable system, and I think, look, I, as I said at the very first question, I'm amazed at how quickly mobile content has grown already, and I think we're in the first inning. I think we're going to see it grow rapidly from here. Engagement can continue to increase then if, if well, I think the right one thing, shows up. One thing that's interesting, which is a little known fact, is which seems crazy, I don't, I don't know the exact statistic, but I think this, the statistic is the average American watches seven or eight hours of television a day. That number is actually up 50% in the last 10 or 15 years. And it's not because people are sleeping less, maybe because they're working less, but uh, it, it's really for two reasons. One is, or three reasons. One is that because of DVRs and the proliferation of channels, there's more choice for them, so there's more things that they want to watch. Secondly is be, entirely because of mobile, there are hours a day which were otherwise not available to watching video, which they're now watching video on their commute, they're watching video when they're sitting in the airport, they're watching video anytime, you know, I'm sure if you walk the hall out here, anytime anybody has 10 minutes to spare, they're watching video. That added a bunch of time. So there is a lot more video consumption going on, and a lot of it is because of the gift of mobile. Glad to hear that. We're making that big bet on that personally. So uh, I appreciate the affirmation on that. Peter, I really appreciate you taking the time to share some thoughts with everybody today. Certainly with the room full of folks in this ecosystem, very insightful things that we can take forward and figure out how to grow our businesses effectively. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all.